This webinar is part of the Let's Talk webinar series presented by the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. My name is Sarah Payton and I will be uh, your webinar host today. Today's webinar is Having Conversations About Race, Bias, and Equity, presented by Dr. Rosemary Allen. Welcome, Dr. Allen. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here and excited to have this conversation. This webinar is, is designed to be interactive and informative, so we're looking forward to you asking questions throughout the presentation. Um, this is an informal conversation about race, bias, and equity in early childhood. And I would like to introduce you to our amazing panel. First, we have Norval Rock Dillard. He's the National Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Strategist. And we have Lisa Gordon from the Center on Culture, Race, and Equity at Bank Street College of Education. And we have Dr. Chantel Meek from the Children's Equity Project, hosted out of Arizona State University. I'd like to start this webinar just starting out um, with a discussion around Dr. Walter Gilliam's recent research. In 2016, Dr. Gilliam and his team, they conducted a research project and found that early childhood teachers judge children's behavior differently based on race. Early childhood teachers were asked to watch a clip of four children in an early classroom setting. There were a white boy, a white girl, a black boy, and a black girl. And the participants were asked to watch the clip to anticipate behaviors that they thought may become problematic. What the participants did not know was that the video clip contained, um, the participants in the video clip were all child actors. So there were absolutely no challenging behaviors at all. And they also didn't know that eye tracking devices were being used so that the researchers could track their eye movements and identify what child was being watched. And the results showed that the black boy was watched more than any other child. And 42% of the participants actually said he required more of their attention. This study is one of the first of its kind and it shows how early childhood teachers are impacted by implicit bias in their perceptions of children and their behavior. And I'm going to now turn to our panel so that we can begin to unpack this and talk about other issues related to race, bias, and equity in early childhood. So Chantel, you've recently co-authored an article on implicit bias in, East, in early childhood education. Do you mind sharing the highlights of that study, of that report? Chantal, I think you might be on mute. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Dr. Allen. I'm so pleased to be here with all of you uh, today to, to talk about an issue that's near and dear to all of our hearts, I know. Um, so yes, uh, last year, Dr. Gilliam and I published an article that was more specifically about um, exclusionary discipline, kind of in the broader uh, context of, of civil rights and social justice and uh, in, in our country. And so um, a part of that, of course, is, is implicit bias. And so really what we covered in the, um, in the study was first, how we often talk about the school to prison pipeline. Um, but when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, we often neglect to attend to the earliest entry point of the school to prison pipeline. And of course, we know, uh, based on Dr. Gilliam's research, based on data from the uh, uh, Department of Education and others, that children could have been suspended or expelled 10 times before they even step into their kindergarten classroom. Um, they could have been labeled numerous times. They could have been um, they could have had very negative experiences that, that would kind of set their trajectories in a negative direction long before they enter kindergarten. Um, so we're, really we talk about being a little bit more, um, I guess, accurate and attending to the earliest entry point. Um, and we really can't talk about the school to prison pipeline if we don't attend to the entry point. Um, the second thing we really talked about was uh, just how uh, children of color have less access to high quality early childhood programs um, from the front door and from the back door. And what we meant by that was um, they have, they are less likely to be able to access 
high quality early childhood programs, so from the front door. Um, and they're also more likely to be pushed out the back door from early childhood programs through expulsion and suspension. Um, and so it kind of goes two ways and both of those things combined um, really results in, in much less access to high quality experiences um, for many kids of color. Um, the other thing we really touch on is uh, just different, uh, different potential reasons that, that could explain the higher rate of expulsion and suspension in early childhood settings. Um, and so some of the things that we talk about are just workforce conditions. We know that the early childhood workforce is underpaid, overworked, overstressed, um, and lacks resources and uh, coaching and supports. And so uh, there is data that show that, um, you know, stress and depression and, and some of these other factors um, are associated with higher rates of expulsion and suspension. And so that could be one contributing factor. Um, we know that the early childhood system is less of a system than, than K-12, for example, and so we have a lot of uh, early childhood centers or family child care providers or others that are kind of disconnected from a broader system of support. Um, so that could be contributing. We know that um, as uh, silly as it sounds, uh, there is not nearly enough training on behavioral development and social emotional development for the early childhood workforce. And if anybody has ever known or interacted with or worked with a child from birth to five, you know that every single one of them is going to have a temper tantrum or bite or hit or do something at some point, 100% um, of them, right? And if you uh, don't have the, the skills or the training or the understanding for what is developmentally appropriate um, for kind of how to manage these behaviors, um, then, then it's, it's going to result in a lot of challenges and probably some expulsion and suspensions. Um, and the last one, which is obvious and why we're talking about what we're talking about today is bias, implicit bias. So all of those previous reasons explain the higher rates of expulsion and suspension, but they don't explain the racial disparities. But the implicit bias component um, is part of what really is driving a lot of the racial disparities that we see in disproportionate discipline. Um, so then we kind of dig in to the research on bias and kind of highlight some of the studies done, you know, not, not too many in early childhood, but more in K-12 and then some outside of the K-12 system. Um, so I'll just briefly give you just the top lines on some of those studies that kind of lead us to believe, to understand that, that bias is playing a role in this. Um, the first of these is uh, some researchers conducted a study on empathy. And they wanted to see at what age kind of empathy developed and if that differentiated uh, between empathy for, for different races. And so they asked children at age five, at age seven, I believe, and at age 10, um, they asked children, how bad does it hurt from a scale of one to 10 when you bite your tongue? How bad does it hurt when you, you know, get your finger in the door or bump your head? And so then they'd have to rate how bad it hurt them. And then they were shown a picture of a white child. How, how bad does it hurt this child? And then they were shown a picture of a black child. How bad does it hurt this child? And they'd have to rate how, you know, how bad, what, you know, the pain they felt. And what the researchers found was that at age five, the kids pretty much rated everyone as feeling the same amount of pain based on these different experiences. But by, but by the next interval, they were rating black children as feeling less pain uh, than their white peers. And so when we start to think about when these implicit biases start to form in, in childhood really, and how they're reinforced through media, through everything else, kind of throughout the lifespan, it's not a surprise that implicit bias is extremely pervasive in all of our systems um, and in everyone. Um, there have been other studies that have shown that um, uh, black children are rated as being four and a half years older than they actually are, uh, less innocent, more culpable. Um, there's been other studies that have kind of presented teachers with two just like behavior incident reports that are exactly the same, but one of them has a stereotypical white child's name, one of them has a stereotypical black child's name, um, and then they're asked to, to kind of decide what the discipline should be for each of these child with an identical behavior incident report. Um, and what they find is that uh, the teachers are more likely to recommend a harsher punishment uh, for the black child, uh, even though 
the behaviors are all the same, right? It's written down. It's not even observed. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a few other studies that I'll just mention really briefly, but there's other studies that look at automatic associations. So they'll show like words such as aggressive or, you know, other negative type words. And they'll see kind of track where people look first at white faces or at black faces. Um, and, you know, uh, black faces are more uh, associated, automatically associated with these negative words like aggressive. And these are faces of children as young as five years old. So again, when we look at what's, what's contributing to these disparities and expulsion and suspension, if we're seeing black children as older than they are, less innocent, more guilty, um, you know, more likely uh, to be aggressive or to ha automatically associate with some of these negative words, then that kind of explains a lot of these significant racial disparities that we see starting in, in toddlerhood almost. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll stop there. I think I've been talking for a long time, but, but that's kind of, that gives you an idea of what the, what the report looked at. And Chantel, it's really amazing how the research that you've highlighted, how it plays out in the real world. And I've seen many, many instances, even in my own family. I remember when my son was three years old and I took him to the bathroom with me and a woman came in and, and pretty much attacked him. I had him standing outside the door while I went into the stall and said, boys don't belong in the bathroom. What are you doing here? And don't you know how to go to the boys' bathroom? And when you talk about a child being seen as less innocent and more culpable, he was a toddler. Most parents, most this was before the family restrooms, but most families take their children in the restroom with them, male or female. And I just have so many examples of a mother of having this African-American male who was tall. So he, was old, he looked older, but he at all times, no matter what age or stage, was thought to be older than he was, definitely. I can give just one quick real life example as well. Um, you know, my, my cousin's son uh, in first grade, um, his uh, teacher called uh, my cousin up and was like, hey, you know, we need to talk about, you know, his behavior. He's being, he's, uh, being aggressive. Mm -hmm. She was like, wow, that's a really charged word. Like, I'm very concerned. What exactly is he doing to, to, for you to call him aggressive? And she found out she, she had a very hard time, like, pinning down exactly what the behavior was that that would have constituted the word aggressive um and finally after after a lot of probing uh decided that uh when they were in line to leave the classroom and all the kids had their backpacks on him and another boy were just bumping backpacks um and and of course he was the one labeled aggressive right not not the other child and so that's just another example of how you know he's in first grade he's six years old um but but there's this notion now in, in the head that, oh, he's, he's aggressive. That's the aggressive one. Absolutely. Lisa, what has been your experience with racial inequities in early childhood programs? What have you witnessed and how was it handled? Well, thanks so much. Uh, and again, um, Rosemary and uh, the rest of my panel here, I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, in my experience, uh, the racial inequities play out in both subtle, but so often more subtle ways for both families, for both the children, but also their families. And uh, most of what I'm finding is that it really is steeped in the beliefs that we as adults have about children and families and what we believe and think about who they are, their motivations, um, their intentions and their potential. And, you know, it's interesting because I think in early childhood, we know what's right and what's good for children. We know with the three core um, tenets of developmentally appropriate practice, we know that, right? But yet we don't afford that to every child equally. And bias is really at the center of this, as Chantel played, uh, explained in some of uh, the research that she and Dr. Gilliam had done. Um, but what happens in all of that is this deficit narrative starts to play out, right? And this deficit thinking, um, some of what Chantel picked out in terms of the culpability of, 
of children, brown children, children of color, um, and starting as early as that entry point. Um, and other things in terms of that sense of empathy, it, it's lost when we start having those deficit thinking or narratives about the potential, the motivations. And what is beginning is what I see happen, it's really, uh, um, really uh, damaging and, and disconnecting that relationship, which we know in early childhood is so important between adults and children and children and families. And whether that be just teachers, classroom teachers, it can be administrators because the learning for children does not just, it's not just isolated in the classroom, but it's the entire environment. So when a center director or a um, cafeteria worker um, has a deficit view or narrative of child that is perpetuated in that entire learning environment for that child. And what I see in the way I see that playing out, or I guess maybe before I say about where I see it playing out, I think the, what's, it, it, what is really at the center of all that is this intersection between race, social class and gender. Right, so, so often we think of it as white teachers and adults who are misunderstanding children of color. But what I've seen in our work is that it's adults, whether you be a, a, a white, whether you're black, whether you are Latinx, but somehow within that intersection, you find yourself. We have a very heavily feminized environment in early education and just an education in general with women, right? So we don't necessarily find maybe continuity in understanding behaviors of boys. Mm -hmm. And boys from the data are so much more disproportionately represented in a lot of the um, disparities that we see. Um, we know that the Department of Ed's research uh, that came out with the civil rights data collection shows us that. And children of color, Black children, and in particular boys, are at the higher end of suspensions, expulsions, and disciplinary actions. And so gender gets us. And you can be a brown teacher teaching brown children. But if you don't understand behavior of boys, then that pushing with the back, uh, that backpack, Chantal, that you were talking about, becomes aggressive and defiant behavior when it might just be boys just kind of sharing in a moment of, of just playing with one another. And so we, we misunderstand from that point. And of course, race, which is definitely the centrality of race we can't deny in our society, but that continues to play out, like Chantel said, at the entry points of infancy uh, and early childhood programs. And so we see those things playing out. And then with social class, you can be a brown, uh, or a, a, a teacher of color teaching brown children, but maybe you have um, values that are more in line with um, uh, a higher resource thinking or ways of being and not being able to understand or have that empathy for other ways of knowing and being. Um, so that's something that I'm seeing play out and what it looks like. And I love that you asked that. Rosemary, what does it look like? What I see is I can walk into a classroom and immediately determine who the child is. That is the quote unquote bad child in the classroom. And I use that term, um, not that I'm feeling that that's the right term, but that's what it, 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 it gets to be for some children. The stigmatization, which is what we learned in research called this stereotype threat when I am hearing negative things about me when the narrative about me, about who I am becomes negative. I tend to take on some of that negativity and I begin to believe it. And the stereotype threat says over time, children begin to believe it. And what we know about children early on is they want and they long for that attachment and that affection with adults in caring environments. And when that doesn't happen, the only way they know to respond might be behaviors that we find challenging. So, but they're wanting attention. They're wanting our, 
our support and our empathy, but yet what we're finding is children are excluded from learning environments. <clears throat> so you'll walk in a room and there is always a boy, usually, sitting in a corner by himself or maybe with a teacher and they're having a conversation about his behavior, um, whatever that behavior be, defiance, other behaviors. Um, and the boy is usually in a, in a state where you can see there's frustration, but you don't always see the empathy from the adult. And what I think we forget often, and I love um, Dan Gartrell talks about with his power of guidance, that we forget that children are really months old when we're talking about early childhood, right? So when we have a child who's two years old, they're 24 months old. They've lived on this earth for 24 months. Mm -hmm. When a child is um, five years old, just getting ready to go to kindergarten, they've only lived for 64 months in this world. So behaviors aren't something that they can master. They haven't mastered these yet, but yet we are not giving children the time and the needed attention and focus to social, emotional learning and development, which we know, again, going back to those three core competencies and tenets of developmentally appropriate practice, because the bias gets in the way. And then we have these negative thinking and narrative about the behavior, such as defiance or boys um, play that mm -hmm. tends to really just be about the touching and the feeling and the karate chops uh, where they say that some of that for boys has just as much meaning as two girls sitting on a bench holding hands. Mm -hmm. But understanding that and being aware of that can really change our response. But yet the narrative and the deficit thinking hold us to make kids accountable for behaviors they have not yet mastered. And so we penalize through exclusionary practices. And I think um, we've talked and uh, Chantel was talking about expansion, expulsions and suspensions. But sometimes we forget that we only change the, you know, slight, you know, what is actually the definition, right? And some of us feel that when we're talking about suspensions, that it's a child who has been, has left the program. But I see when I walk in those rooms, children that are suspended, taken away from learning environments, mm -hmm. or even made to learn on their own. Uh, for example, um, I just tell a story of a child who, um, we were doing an observation and um, walked into the classroom and the children were engaged in a uh, read aloud activity. Another child came in and the child was with an adult. So I assumed that the child may have had a pull out service and was coming in with an adult. But when the child walked in the room, the teacher did not even welcome the child. There was no hello, his name was never mentioned. Um, but the children, the rest of the children were given instructions as to what the options were for now center time. And they all moved to centers. And this one child still seemed to be moving around, not really certain where to go. The teacher pointed to him as in to point to where he could go. But he never, his name was never mentioned. He tried to engage in some other learning activities with other uh, children. And the children, I noticed, even didn't use his name, but called out the teacher and said, Miss so-and-so, he's bothering us. He's in our space. And she came over and directed the child and said, here is where you need to be working. You're working in this station right now. But she never used his name. That child was a brown child, a boy. And watching this interaction and it played out for about 20 minutes. And this was a teacher who was supposed to be an exemplary teacher. She had some great practices, like again, knowing what we know is right with developmentally appropriate practice, but she was not aware of her own bias of how that was playing out for this young boy who eventually got so frustrated 
that he just pushed off the, uh, the, the materials off of one table in anger because no one was listening or speaking to him and no one used his name. And then he was taken to a timeout corner because of his behavior. So that's just an example. And I, I think I'll stop there because I, I don't want to dominate uh, uh, the conversation, but open it up for additional conversation. But this is where we're thinking of things like, you know, where's the empathy and understanding what's behind that behavior. The teacher missed that cue that there was a reason for his frustration. But what struck me most is he never had a name wow. in a 20 minute observation. That's really amazing. Lisa, thank you so much. There's a lot to unpack with what you said. You cover a lot of ground, especially the intersection with race, gender, and class. We had a question from Lisa, and she asked, are these teacher behaviors the same or different for white and black teachers? And I think you answered that beautifully. We've been talking a lot about implicit bias, but I'd like to move over to Rock. And, and Rock, you specialize in this training. And can you briefly describe for us what implicit bias is and some of the things that we need to be aware of as we broach these topics? First, I'd like to say thank you so much, Rose, for me, Marie, for having me on, and Chantel and Lisa. It's always it's a pleasure to be joining you here today. And I'm just fascinated by, uh, by your comments, uh, how much they're all intertwined. And we have all talked a little bit about unconscious bias. Unconscious bias refers to the attitudes as well as stereotypes that affect our understanding, it affects our actions, and absolutely it affects our decisions. The dangerous part is in an unconscious manner. Sometimes we don't know we're doing it. So one of the things I will tell you is there are so many different factors that weigh in to unconscious bias. It could certainly be your culture, it could be your gender, income, sexual orientation, how you brought up, your upbringing, physical activity. There are so many different things that tie in. I'm reminded of uh, last year when we worked uh, in an effort uh, on this childhood uh, de uh, early development effort. There was a white teacher who admitted, she said, I don't know why, but when I walk into a classroom and I see a little black kid, little black boy walk in and he's running around and he's jumping, I say to myself, that's one I have to watch. I've got to keep my eye on him because he's going to be trouble. Same exact scenario, a little white girl comes in and she admits. Now, she's innovative. She's active. She's going to be a winner in the class. Now, she admitted it was wrong. She didn't know why she felt that way, but she did. But one thing that was good about that that's very important was she recognized that it was an unconscious bias. She accepted that she had a bias. And that's one of the things that when we train, we have great difficulty uh, with unconscious bias because someone always thinks, oh, okay, I guess you're telling me I, I'm a racist, but I don't know I'm a racist. And so many different things uh, conjure up for those who don't really understand what it is. But we all have unconscious bias. It could be anything from a restaurant, from different things. We've, you know, bad experience at, at a restaurant. You say, I'll never eat at another Denny's. Could be the best menu ever, but you're done with it for, for some experience you had. Could be a dog. You got, you know, uh, 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 maybe a German Shepherd or a Rottweiler or a Doman Pinscher. You go nowhere near it because you know whatever history you think. But you walk over to a Chihuahua and you'll pat it and you'll get bit much quicker than you will the others. And you wonder why right? Because you don't know what you don't know. And your unconscious bias will have you think a certain way, particularly when you talk about people of which you all have eloquently gone through and talked about before. Now I'll go back to my point in stating that accepting you have a bias is number one. But the other part of this is doing a self-evaluation. Question yourself. Why do I feel this way about this black kid and not the others? One of the things I will tell you that was a little bit surprising to me uh, 25 years ago, I uh, we adopted a uh, elementary school in, in, in the city of D.C. And I can tell you, 25 years ago, and again, maybe about 10 years ago, I went back to the same school. And I can tell you, the kids were extremely intelligent. But what I, what surprised me was, I thought the boys, my unconscious bias, would be aggressive, and I'd have to keep them in line. But it was the little girls. They were punching, 
They were karate kicking. They were all over the boys. Now, the boys were doing wrong things, too. They were in the hallway. shouldn't be. But I'm telling you, the little girls were even more aggressive than the boys. So my unconscious bias, I was shocked. I was like, wow, I got to tell them now to do what I thought I'd have to tell the boys to do. But those are some of the things you, 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 that come in place. Now, one of, the, one of the things I mentioned earlier to uh, Dr. Meeks was uh, I did some research to find out, in particular for this session, uh, some issues, why, ways teachers practice unconscious uh, discrimination and some of how to fix it. One of the first things that came up was, and, and I think you all hit it, the nail on the head, boys are out of control in the classroom. That's teacher bias number one. When they come in, okay, where are the boys? I got to control these boys, right? That's one of the things that come up. Uh, and that's a, that's a gender bias that uh, could, could not sometimes be further from wrong. However, that's what a lot of times they think coming in. Another bias is girls aren't good in math. Now, there are studies that have come up where they look at the same grades, but for whatever reason, they look at it different for the little girls than they looked at for the boys. Uh, another, that, uh, another bias was that students you like get better grades. Now, we're all familiar with the uh, teacher's pet concept. And they say out of one out of 10 classes, they designated somewhere there was a teacher pet in there. But I can tell you that once that happens, that unconscious bias that this kid is more special than others, one the other kids feel it. And that ties to a bias called like me bias. You've seen it as grownups. You see it even as kids where, well, he's kind of like I was when I was a kid or she's like me or she or her mother I know or whatever reason why they like that person, they get better treatment or different treatment. And I can tell you, uh, there's been studies that show that the same pain associated with stumping your toe, that same piece of your brain that activates also activates when you're not included. And this is what happens sometimes. We don't realize how it affects folks, but it does. But I can tell you the like me bias is one that folks tend to, you know, want to do something uh, special for somebody they like. Uh, that, and then what was mentioned earlier, what happens to the one who doesn't get the name called? The one that feels they're being punished. That's one of those things that affects a child, whether teachers realize it or not, it does affect them. Now, I had a, a young man, he had uh, been in four or five different schools before elementary school. I couldn't believe it until I realized this epidemic we have nationwide. But today, that young man is writing plays. He's a recording artist. He's doing all kinds of things that no one would have imagined him to be. Another person who's a personal friend of mine, he was held back three times, kindergarten first and first again and was put in a special class until his mom got involved. This young man just retired as a colonel. He ran the, ar the largest army hospital in the United States Army, but they would have thought that he would have been one that would not have measured up to any of that. But those are the things that the, the biases that can affect us. But I would also say that we've got to get out of our comfort zone. You know, when we see a child that might be introvert, because that's one of the other biases, that a child that's introvert is one that is not smart. Sometimes that person that's just like today, just because a person's quiet doesn't, doesn't mean they don't understand. In fact, they understand a lot more than others because they're listening, not talking. But as a kid, we sometimes separate them out. And what that does, it, it breathes the ground for others to sometimes uh, be mean or sometimes separate them out. And that's not good in any, any sense of the word. So we got to be mindful of that and step out of our comfort zone and reach out to understand just because they're different doesn't mean they're wrong because everybody's different. And be open. Another thing we have to look at is give up the idea of perfection. Nobody's perfect. Perfe per per perfection can be the, uh, the enemy of progress or someone making it and also focus on ourselves and respect others. And most important, and we all do this, when we mess up, we need to own it. Because a lot of times people realize we're messing up, we don't own it, we need to own that. And I think that's, that's one of those things that's important in terms of uh, unconscious bias and realizing it starts with us and then we reach out and be inclusive. One of the things that I would share with you uh, as I close my portion, this is important for uh, engagement. 
And there are five pieces of engagement, employee or student engagement that's important. And that's being fair, because it's like high, Maslow's hierarchy uh, in that food is most important, fairness is most important. If they think you're not fair, it's game over. But fairness, being open, communication, also being cooperative with them, be empowering those who might not be slow, might be quiet, encourage them. And then last but not least, be supportive. Nice. Thank you so much, Brock. Yes. We do have a couple of questions. One is, do you have, and this is for all per, um, panelists, do you have any tips for talking to teachers about this disproportionality in a way that values their experience of being stressed and overwhelmed in the classroom? and also encourages them to recognize their own implicit bias in the situation. So one of the things that I often talk about is that we have to deliver this information in a way that people can hear it and embrace it and not ever to engage in any type of training or professional development activities that blames or shames. How would you all handle this? Lisa? Uh, thanks, Rosemary. Um, that's a, a great question. Um, and I think what you just said, Rosemary, in terms of creating a space, and I call it a space, um, and, and you may have heard of Glenn uh, Singleton that talks about creative conversations about race, right? And that's really what it is, creating a space to have these creative conversations. But the space has to be one, like you said, Rosemary, where people feel a sense of trust and openness to be able to share. And what we do in our training uh, to be able to start that space is create that commonality of really understanding where we all begin. And um, we, we use a lot of um, Bronfen Brenner's bioecological system, right? Because we all come from bioecological systems and culture is really a, a huge piece of that. And when you start to unpack what culture really is, then we understand that culture is deeper than what we see. And that what it boils down to, we always use the, um, the uh, iceberg uh, analogy of uh, culture. And I think many people have seen that before where at the top of that iceberg is 10% of the visible, right? So I see color of your skin. I see maybe clothing that you wear, but beneath that surface or beneath that iceberg, what are your values of self? What are your values and, and beliefs about child rearing? What are your notions of time? Um, or what are the roles uh, that you see important for men and women? What, is, what constitutes a family to you? And these are the kinds of deeper conversations that we don't dialogue about with each other. And we certainly forget to dialogue about that with families. So when we bring and start the conversation, we want to have a space where we can start with some common ground. And culture is common for all of us because it really just constitutes the rules and relationships that shape behavior and allow individuals to interact in ways that uh, they understand each other. And so culture is something that we all have. And so by starting where it's common, you can then begin to dig deeper into the other issues. And I, I wanna also share that I think um, what's so important when you begin these conversations is these conversations cannot happen in a three hour session mm -hmm a one day session, and then you anticipate that there would be significant change. These need to be ongoing conversations where adults, teachers, school leaders have time to reflect. It's the reflection that's key on what they've learned and then kind of operationalize it in real time, in a real time manner. So having time in your planning and lesson planning and conversations between uh, lead teachers, assistant teachers as a team, um, having dialogue at staff meetings where you can continue to reflect and come back. How are we doing? 
How are we feeling about that? What are some examples? Um, how did that work for you this time around? What was challenging about that? What was successful? And often we also say that sometimes when you're trying new things, you start with one child. Uh, we ask teachers sometimes to start with the most difficult child when you're trying a new strategy and then have time to reflect. But in response to that question, Rosemary, you know, how and that, that the person asked about, you know, what type of, um, uh, how do you begin to have these conversations? It's really creating the space and dialogue where it's open and you start with something common and then being able to dig deeper. And what happens is when people can humanize the experience, it then breaks those barriers of race, gender, and uh, social class to just being human and having human thoughts, having human emotions. And then I can look at that child, I can look at that family, and I can say, wow, I never really thought about it. I never really thought that, yeah, they've gone through a lot. But that doesn't mean because that family lives in a lower resource community that they don't love their children, that they're not trying their best and not doing it in the way that maybe I might do something, but that's me. And that might be significant to who I am, but I being open and um, receptive to other ways of knowing and being is the key and essence of beginning these dialogues and allowing them to get deep and rich and be able to self-reflect. Absolutely. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, oh, go ahead, Chantel. Oh, just really quickly, just uh, to add just two really quick things on, on the conversation. I think one, using data, and we haven't, we haven't talked about this piece yet, but it's, it's really hard to deny when you have hard numbers in front of you. Um, I know uh, the PBIS uh, TA Center um, has done a lot of work with this in, in kind of really incorporating data as, as the baseline, like here are the numbers. There are clearly some disparities here. Now let's have a conversation about what's behind these. Um, and the second thing, and I think Rock touched on it, and I think Lisa touched on it, but really depersonalizing it in a way, it's, it's not you, right? It's, it's all of us. And, you know, I know Walter Gilliam often says, there are two types of people, people with implicit bias who recognize it and want to address it, and people with implicit bias uh, who deny it and who don't. In other words, we all have implicit bias, right? It's just a matter of if we're ready or not to talk about it. So um, I just wanted to add those two things. And, and the third, right, we, we shouldn't wait to have these conversations until we have a great well-resourced system. We should be having them now. Um, but at the same time, these other factors, you know, I know the, the person who asked the question mentioned, you know, we want to recognize that teachers are stressed and overworked and underpaid and often don't have breaks and, you know, don't have support. Um, so kind of working on the infrastructure pieces as advocates, uh, as kind of as a community more broadly, as we also, you know, have these really important conversations and make the spaces uh, is important. But sorry, go ahead, Rock. No, that's, that's an excellent point by you and Lisa as well. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, just the diversity and inclusion piece of it all. Uh, diversity is uh, being asked uh, to the dance, but inclusion is being asked to dance. So I say that to say, if we are more inclusive of those who might be different across the board, that could be other teachers, that could be the students, then what happens is we open up for different ideas, for more innovation, for folks to be feel like they're included. Once you feel like you're included, and you can bring your best thing to the table, then certainly whatever you have, you can improve the overall bottom line of what you're working. I can tell you there are millions and billions of dollars that are lost every year by corporations and other folks that just simply leave because they don't have satisfaction. They don't feel like they're included. So I think overall, that's an important thing I want to mention, not only with, uh, with the grownups, but particularly when you, when you have the children, because it's so easy to be out or be the last one to be picked for something, not think that it affects them, but it does affect them. So we as grownups gotta recognize that and really be open, step out of our comfort zone and do those things we don't normally do to make folks included and makes folks, make sure others uh, can certainly uh, be a part of what we do. So that's the comment I wanna make.
think you're on mute, Rosemary. Thank you so much. We have a few more minutes before we wrap up, but um, Lisa, I would love if you can add, address the part of that question that related to teacher stress. Yeah, thanks, Rosemary. And I know we only have a few more questions, but uh, a few more times, but a few more minutes. But I did want to say that that is so important to address. And I'm sorry I didn't do that about the teacher stress. And thank you, Chantel, for reminding us. Um, it's so important um, when we've had um, these focused reflections and opportunities for, for to come together to have these conversations. What often is helpful is to come up as a team with what ways we can help support each other. So that whole mindfulness um, as adults, right? But ways of um, providing space. Um, sometimes uh, what I've seen some teachers talk about is when there's a point in time when the stress gets just a little bit overbearing when the tone is rising a little higher in response to children, they have like a hand signal that they use where they know, oh yeah, take time out, right? Um, but so that's in the moment. But then we need to really think about very planned, planned ways that we can support staff. You can bring yoga into your staff, um, into your program, other things that you might offer staff during break time or other things, even changing the staff room sometimes to add some aromatherapy. <laughs> it sounds all good and cushiony, right? But it matters, it so matters because this is hard work. It's the hardest work, but the most important work. So we have to really celebrate and pamper each other and realize that we need to take time out to um, set uh, the stage for our own health and well-being. And I just wanted to add to that quickly. Thank you. Chantel, were you going to add something? I was just going to say that that the break room and everything else is important, but first and foremost, making sure teachers have breaks. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't skip their breaks yeah. because that's, I mean, that's another big issue, right? Just getting really fundamental, right? That's, you know, they, they're working long days um, in a high stress job and they're, they either don't have breaks available or they do and they don't take them because they feel that they're too busy. So like at the very basic level, like start with offering breaks and making sure those breaks are taken. I'd like to, I'd like to add in a comment, something that worked for me uh, almost 27 years in the Army was what I call three ups and three downs. You can do it with grownups, you can do it with kids. And what you do is pick maybe once a month and you have three ups and three downs. The first up may be you all are doing terrific. Got all your homework in on time. Keep up the great work. They give you an up. An up is you are an awesome teacher. We love you. Then you give a down. The down is you're not studying as you should study. They give you a down. The down is you give too much homework. But the bottom line is the both of you have the opportunity to shape and improve each other where you don't have that avenue before. And it really, really works because every month what happens is you kind of self-correct and you otherwise you'll never know this. But it's one of those things where you have transparency, not only again, not only with students, but you can do this with grown-ups. And what happens is in a controlled environment, instead of screaming and getting feelings hurt, you actually get to, to talk about those problems you have that you can resolve. And after a while, you don't have three ups and three downs. You might have one or two. And trust me, it works. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask each of you to just take a, a moment, just one minute, and um, think about your final thoughts. And as you think about them, if you can touch upon the danger of colorblind ideology and the difference between equity and fairness or equality. All right, why don't we start with you, Chantal? On the spot. Um, I think my final thoughts are that, you know, I, I know somebody mentioned, um, so my, my thought goes immediately to intervention, right? Like we have lots of data that show that there are these disparities. We've seen this play out, you know, with our own eyes in programs. We've seen the data, we've heard the research. Um, now, like, what do we do about it, right? And Rock provided some, some good concrete strategies. Lisa's provided some good strategies and, and developed a model. And, um, but we need more in, in the space of intervention, specifically incorporating implicit bias into some of the broader social-emotional 
type interventions that we have. I know one of the participants asked about mental health, early childhood mental health consultation um, and its role in, in all of this. And, and I think it has an important role in all of this, right? Like someone with a, with a strong mental health background who, you know, reflective supervision and reflective practice is core to their mission and core to their work. But I think we need to be more explicit in making sure implicit bias and race and equity, um, as, as all those things relate to specific behaviors, um, how we incorporate all of that into our interventions. Because, because just, just having the conversation is the first step. I know Rosemary always says, you know, aware is halfway there, right? But we also need concrete actions and, and interventions to help prevent our implicit biases from manifesting into actions that affect children. Um, so my final thoughts are, are really on that. And, you know, as to the colorblind approach, you know, it's something that's quite common and, and a lot of people talk about it and kind of take that approach. But I think research has found that it's just blatantly ineffective. Um, it, it ignores the problem and it perpetuates it and it kind of reinforces all of our implicit biases because they just kind of go on unchecked um, because we're pretending that they're not there. Um, and so, you know, I know there's, there's some research that, that's exposed young children between like eight and 11 years old to a narrative that, that um, really endorsed colorblindness and then read stories to them about racial bias and discrimination and the kids who were exposed to this colorblind ideology were less able to identify or pick up the fact that there was actual bias and discrimination happening um, in, in these stories than the kids who were kind of shown other ideologies. So we know from childhood and all the way up to adulthood, it, it, it just doesn't work. It's really just doing this um, where, and kind of not really addressing the problem that we, data tells us, research tells us, firsthand experience tells us that we need to address head on. Um, so I think those are my end, end comments. Thank you. All right, Lisa. So um, in terms of the colorblindness piece, I totally agree, Chantel, and with what research has told us, but I think the other part of when we say we're colorblind, we're also, um, um, invalidating um, people, right? We're invalidating uh, the culture that people bring. We're invalidating um, some of those things that we talked about that are under that iceberg, the values that people have, um, the notions and the things that they bring from, from their homes, from their families. And so when we say colorblind, we're just ignoring all of those things that everyone is the same. And everyone is not the same. Everyone doesn't have the same ways of knowing and being, but it's more of getting to that point of validating individuals, different ways of knowing and being. And when we say color blindness, we tend to cut that off. Um, in terms of like sort of my final thoughts and, and thinking, I guess I go to the fact that um, as an intervention, um, there is no silver bullet. And I think sometimes often people look for, well, tell me the five things that I can do to be more culturally responsive, to, be, to have more equitable environments and, and, and experiences for my children and family. But it begins with self. Um, and with that self start, uh, what we need to do is to not only just within ourselves work through that, but to be more um, vigilant in helping to advocate for change. So when we see things that are not right, when we see unfairness, when we see things that just seem questionable, that we raise the question. We raise that uh, level of, um, we surface that and raise that to have the dialogue to say, you know what, I noticed that and I wonder why. Or I noticed that and I wonder if we may have approached it in a different way. Or I noticed that and it really had an effect on me. So not to remain silent, right? To remain silent when we see inequities, but to really be advocates for change for our children and our families by starting with self and being ready to speak up for those who sometimes can't speak for themselves. Thank you, Lisa. All right, Brock. You know, as I think about the, uh, the colorblind piece, uh, I think you ladies were spot on. You know, to, 
say that you're colorblind basically ignores who you are. I think we should celebrate if we're black, if we're white, Asian, whatever we are, celebrate the differences because it's the differences that makes us strong. We don't all want to be alike. God didn't make us that we are all one person. We are all different. And we can certainly celebrate and learn from one another to improve. As I think as a final thought about the diversity as well as the equity and inclusion piece, that should be a common thread that goes throughout the entire thing. You know, we should be inclusive, we should be diverse, and we should be equitable across the board. And I think the generations that are behind us, some of them, they don't see the color anyway because they're all integrated, you know you're black, you're white, you're gay or whatever. But I don't think they have as many hangups as some of the generations before. And if we continue to drive and, you know, the unconscious bias piece is one we got to continue to work at, no doubt. But in terms of the colorblindness, celebrate who we are, come to the table with what we have, learn from one another, and make ourselves strong as a team. Thank you so much. Panelists, I just want to thank you so much for your time. And participants, we hope that this conversation will inspire and motivate you to begin or to continue the conversations that you're having at your sites in your institutions about race, equity, and a culture of power and privilege. So thank you so much for participating. And now I'm going to give it back to Sarah at NCPMI. Thank you, Rosemary, and thank you to all of our panelists for the wonderful insights on this very important topic. I want to uh, invite everyone to come to the NCPMI website, challengingbehavior.org. Um, the recording of this webinar will be made available on the webinar page uh, that you use to register for the webinar. Uh, on this page in the coming week, we'll also be providing Rosemary's post-webinar vlog, where she will be providing some more uh, information and insights on the topic and also covering uh, some of the many questions that were posed by participants that we just did not have the time to answer. Also on our website, please uh, remember to uh, check out our resource library where we have a number of different uh, pyramid model resources, which include resources on uh, equity, disproportionate discipline, uh, implicit bias, as well as uh, staying tuned to our upcoming webinars um, on these and many other topics.